Hello and welcome to another long overdue episode of But Is It Fun? It's the eve of the one year anniversary of Breath of the Wild, and boy, has it been a huge roller coaster of emotion for me and also the Zelda community. Everyone has been vocal about this game, from loving the game so deeply as to grant it 2017's Game of the Year, to being virtually lynched by its fans for daring to give it a 7 out of 10. It's okay, Jim. I still love you, and surprisingly, understand you more than ever. But it has been a much more difficult ride for me than most, it seems. The Legend of Zelda has been a franchise so closely knit to my gaming life and history that it's hard to do such a large review on it without constantly looking back over my words to see if I got it right this time. It has been my favorite Nintendo franchise for over 20 plus years. Despite those mixed feelings of nostalgia, criticism, and Dear Lord, why? Why Nintendo? I'm here to say that Breath of the Wild isn't a good Zelda game to me. In fact, it's one of the lowest ranking Zelda games in my eyes. But uh, the game won game of the year. How can it be the worst Zelda game ever made? Now hold on a second, drop your torches and pitchforks. Breath of the Wild happens to be a masterfully crafted game, well deserving of the high praise it's been getting. Do I believe it's game of the year material? Possibly. I'll make my decision after I've explained my experiences with this game. I would also like to say that this video isn't to prove any facts of the Zelda timelines or universes, or to argue my opinion is the true opinion that should be regarded as fact. These are just my thoughts on Breath of the Wild as a game, and I hope you all can understand that. You see, Breath of the Wild is that masterfully crafted game I called it moments ago. One that was not only beautiful, but rich with experiences and gameplay that felt polished and fulfilling at the beginning of your journey. But the main issue I had with it was that you could have taken any intellectual property and thrown it over Breath of the Wild and still had a masterful game. Because Breath of the Wild lacks almost everything that a Zelda game requires in order to be considered a good entrance compared to the others in the franchise. The downloadable content packs will not be counted towards the overall evaluation of this game, since I really have no desire to purchase and play them. Plus, this is supposed to be an opinion on the base game before the decision to purchase further content. So, it's time to take a dive into the most divisive Zelda game I've ever played in my history of gaming and answer the age-old question, but is it fun? The story of Breath of the Wild, at its core, is not much different than many of the other Zelda games in the franchise. Ganon was sealed away during a great war 10,000 years ago by the ancestors of our beloved blonde elf-eared princess and generally green-tunicked mute hero. Ganon has returned in the form of Calamity Ganon to destroy the kingdom of Hyrule. However, this time around, our current incarnation of Princess Zelda and Link could not defeat the beast Ganon, even with the help of the great Sheikah technology that was the Guardians and Divine Beasts. Ganon used his dark powers to turn those Guardians and Divine Beasts against the Kingdom of Hyrule to ensure they could not use them against him again. In a desperate last attempt to ensure one more chance at sealing away Calamity Ganon, Princess Zelda had the utterly defeated Link sent to the Shrine of Resurrection in hopes to save him. With her last bit of power, Princess Zelda did all she could to temporarily seal herself and Calamity Ganon away until Link could return one day. Unfortunately, it has taken Link 100 years to recover from his wounds, and as a result of the Shrine's healing process, he has lost his memories. He is awoken from his regenerative slumber to the sound of a voice beckoning him. So it's your job to wake up from your slumber, follow that beckoning voice in order to recover your memories, find out what's happened to the Divine Beasts, and put an end to Calamity Ganon once and for all. Whew! That was a bit of a mouthful of a story, and it sounds just like every other Zelda game, right? I'd also like to state that I am one of the few people it seems that actually enjoys this incarnation of Princess Zelda. Yes, she's whiny at points, but you'd be very frustrated too if the entire world depended on you and unlocking some magical powers you don't know how to access. She has to travel her entire kingdom to specific hard-to-reach locations to do stupid things like stand in freezing cold water. This girl is trying and risking her life. She's earned a little bit of whining. And her accent is cute. There is no other answer. Foot is down. Her accent is cute. No debate. 
Breath of the Wild seems to be missing two very important key things that are tied to most other Zelda games in the franchise. Mainly, the Triforce. The Triforce was always the tool used to help seal away Ganon for thousands of years at a time. Are we now to believe that the princess alone has that power when none of her previous incarnations had the strength to do so? The Triforce must exist somewhere in the Breath of the Wild story because the three goddesses have springs in the Kingdom of Hyrule, dedicated to their designated traits of courage, wisdom, and power. They even have dragons with similar names that can usually be found patrolling near those springs. Zelda herself travels to these springs in hopes of awakening her power to help seal away Calamity Ganon, so there is evidence that the Triforce has been created in this timeline because of the evidence of the Goddess's Three Springs. Listen, I'm not getting too deep into the timelines like I said before, because it would just make a mess. So if the Triforce exists, then where is it in this rendition of Hyrule? Calamity Ganon can't possibly have it since he hasn't reincarnated in over 10,000 years. This also can't be the timeline where the Triforce was wished out of existence because we see evidence of the Triforce glow on Zelda's hand in one of the cutscenes. So if the Triforce's power is clearly here, why was it abandoned as a necessary tool in sealing away Ganon? Literally the most iconic piece of the Legend of Zelda intellectual property was just casually omitted from this, its largest entry in the franchise. It almost makes it feel as though it was intended to be in the game and then just removed because the game was taking too long to publish. When I think of Zelda, I think of the Triforce and needing to assemble it to defeat the evil beast Ganon, along with finding and empowering the Master Sword. The Master Sword is the second thing that hurts the overall feeling of this Zelda game. Yes, Breath of the Wild does have it, and you can use it, but it's a very weakened version of its former Evil's Bane glory. Yes, for those who don't know, the Master Sword is often referred to as the Blade of Evil's Bane, or sometimes the Sword that Seals the Darkness. Yet, the Master Sword isn't required to do either of those things. You can defeat Calamity Ganon without it. Any regular old rusty broadsword could do, so why even have the Master Sword tied into the story? Why not just say it was destroyed and remove it just like they removed the Triforce's importance? Even the function of the Master Sword feels nothing like it should, making some players feel scared to use it. A bit of real talk here, I never used the Master Sword for anything except Calamity Ganon on my first playthrough of this game. Why? Well, because the game put the fear in me that the Master Sword would permanently break and that it'd need to be recharged by going to an NPC and giving them materials to do so. Because the game taught me this was the normal thing for special weapons in this game. So I never experienced using the Master Sword in regular combat. This means my initial experience with the game didn't have the power of the Master Sword in it because of the patterns that the game had taught me were normal. In previous entries, the Master Sword was this big leap in power. Once you attained it, you felt stronger. The enemies died in less hits. It was a monumental gain for Link to earn this sword. However, I learned on my second playthrough to capture footage for this review that the Master Sword does not break, but instead must rest and spend 10 minutes recharging. Which is horrendously stupid! Since when does Evil's Bane need to take a rest from being the bane of evil monsters? Never. The answer is never. Because evil never sleeps and neither should the thing that defeats it. Without the need for the Triforce or the Master Sword to stop the evil threat, where is the need for this game to be in the Zelda universe? You've always needed at least one of those two items to help seal away Ganon. Without the Triforce or Master Sword's importance, the game doesn't require the Zelda lore to be tied into its story. You could have literally changed the names of the characters and the locations involved, and it wouldn't hold any tie to a Zelda game because it lacks some of its strongest fundamental series plots and devices. That's exactly what makes Breath of the Wild such a breath of fresh air in the Zelda franchise. That the hero no longer requires a special sword to defeat the big bad at the end of the game. The fact that there is no magical assortment of triangles to wish everything away. It's quite freeing to just grab a regular soldier's weapons and beat down Bokoblins with them. This kind of freedom allows the player to dictate their own journey and take away some of the rails that have plagued the Zelda franchise for years. 
The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds also provided players with similar freedom by allowing the player to rent or buy the weapons or items they would need for their adventure before going out to new locations, thus bringing down the potential barriers of exploration. Can we be angry at Breath of the Wild for departing so heavily from some of the more prominent and traditional Zelda plot points? No. Nobody should be upset that this game dared to go in a new direction that many players seemed to enjoy. I firmly believe that this departure is leading to a renaissance of the Zelda formula, and the next main console installment will bring in more steps to evolving the franchise into something new and enjoyable for everyone. Even though I may have sounded a little upset at some of these departures, that's just my inner fanboy trying to rebel. I do recognize these changes as full of potential for the franchise's future. And in the future, creating an inviting world to explore and discover is the first step on that journey. Large, diverse worlds are almost a guarantee when it comes to Zelda games. Everything you can imagine, including the watery domains of the Zora, the fiery mountainous ranges of the Goron, the desolate sands the Gerudo tribe frequently call home, and the skies that the Rito conquer over. In Breath of the Wild, the world is expanded to give each race their own chunk of the Hyrulean landscape, often bleeding over into multiple zones. In previous games, the races usually only had small areas inside their designated one zone. So, in Breath of the Wild, it feels like the races have been given actual domains to explore. Massive tracts of land or river where their people call home. The amazing use of verticality also helps extend the grasp of this world, allowing you to climb to even the highest mountain that you can see off in the distance. There really isn't a place you can't go that you can see. Unless it's raining, and boy, <laughs> does it rain a lot in this game. It felt like each time I absolutely needed to climb somewhere important, it was raining and I had to wait for it to stop. And if you do not have a large stamina pool, climbing while raining is near impossible because of the slipping setback that happens every four to five steps up. There is no workaround for this except for having a larger stamina pool or a lot of food items to replenish your stamina. The music in this game also magnificently accompanies the atmosphere of each region. Whenever you travel to a new region, you can feel the atmosphere change between them, and the music certainly plays a good part in helping that immersion. Along your exploration of this world, you'll find the Sheikah Towers, which will give you regional maps allowing you to see the details of the matching region. You'll also run across a lot, and I mean a lot, of these little structures called shrines. These are your main puzzle-solving fix for this Zelda entry. The majority of these shrines will have a spirit inside that presents you with a challenge. Some are straightforward, like putting a ball into a socket using your Sheikah Slate powers, while others can be major tests of your combat abilities. However, the big issue with all of these shrines is that they all look the same. No matter what region of the world you're in, the shrine's inner chambers do not change in theme. It would have been such an intuitive and beautiful choice to have shrines in the desert have sand or rock used in their puzzles and themes, or similarly, shrines atop mountains have snow and ice in theirs as well. I feel as though this was a large oversight that was not done more than a handful of times in this game. And the only change that I can remember is that some shrines had ivy growing along the walls that you would need to light on fire. Doing over 100 shrines makes them all blend together and become completely unmemorable and lacking any lasting impression. The addition of regional-based theming to these shrines would have been a great touch to world building for Breath of the Wild. Not only that, but on subsequent playthroughs, shrines become more of a chore than anything. And for one of the largest pieces of this game, that's not good. Another huge misstep Breath of the Wild took was that it departed from the classic dungeon formula. Part of the greatness of Zelda games is discovering the new dungeons to delve into and conquer. But in Breath of the Wild, there really is only the five dungeons, if you can call them that. One thing I was hoping for Breath of the Wild to have was discovering dungeons while exploring the world. Just imagine how much cooler it would have been to be exploring a largely forested region of Hyrule, and the further you get into it, the more spiders you keep seeing. The forest trees now become almost entirely covered in webbing, and the floor littered with bones. 
hands. A massive circle of bones lay in front of one of the largest trees in the forest. And as you walk closer, the forest floor breaks away beneath you, and you are now in the lair of Goma, the Spider Queen, and have to escape her dungeon. That would have been an amazing way to have dungeons done, even if they were optional and not story related. It would have filled the world out to have a complete feeling and also provide a major reward for exploration. Instead, the game constantly harps at you, Hey, see that divine beast? Don't forget you have to go there. Huge and majestic, isn't it? It's a shame you have to go inside and defeat it. If only Ganon hadn't taken control of them all and turned them against us. We get it. The game never lets you forget this. It constantly feels like they expect you to stop playing for nine months and come back forgetting what you know. The Divine Beasts also bring about the same feelings that the Shrines did. At no point did I ever feel these Divine Beasts were individuals. They definitely felt very samey and lacking in personality and theme. Zelda games usually have amazing dungeons with tons of flavor and personality, making each one feel like an experience all on their own. But in Breath of the Wild, they feel like they've been designed to pander to the masses, simplistic designs with minimal puzzle solving. You could show me a screenshot from inside one of the four divine beasts and ask me which one it was, and I'd go, I don't know. Even the Ganon Blights of each Divine Beast are laughable because of the flawed and infant stage combat system that destroys Breath of the Wild's combat feel. This is one of the major issues I have with this game. The fact that Breath of the Wild has absolutely no special or unique items or tools for Link to use is unthinkable! Yes, the Sheikah Slate offers you a few cool new abilities, like the ability to stop time for objects and enemies, or use magnetism to move metallic obstacles, or use Cryonis to freeze water to create pillars of ice so you can traverse over water. But they will all pale in comparison to the fun and utility of the Hookshot. The Hookshot was one of the most versatile secondary items Link could have. Not only did it have combat ability, but it also had traversal ability as well. The fact that Link used to collect these special items on his journey were what made certain sections of old games so memorable. The inability to traverse certain areas because you didn't have a Hookshot, or Pegasus Boots, or even something awesome like the Sand Rod. It made areas memorable. To me, they were the heart of Zelda. Not the Master Sword, not the Heart Containers, and not even the Triforce. It was those special items, like the Spinner, that gave the franchise something special, and removing those from Breath of the Wild removed a huge part of the soul of what makes Zelda games fun. Breath of the Wild even rewards you with seemingly special items when you free a Divine Beast. The Chief of the corresponding race will reward you with a special weapon, bow or shield that their champion used to wield 100 years ago. These should have been unbreakable weapons, but instead they ruined them by making it so they can break and you can waste materials recrafting them. They are nothing more than trophy pieces for the house that you can buy in Hatano Village, which takes a long time to invest into as well. Multiple side quests and thousands of rubies later you finally get weapon racks to display these. They shouldn't have been the strongest weapons, mind you, but they certainly should not have had durability. This way, you always have at least one item of each type you can rely on that reminds you of your fallen champion friends. It would have added at least a little emotional depth to your journey. A deeper player connection to their favorite champion or race. It also would have added a feeling of progression to this game. A feeling of progression is certainly something this game lacks very heavily. No matter how strong you become, the enemies always become stronger with you, leading to it just feeling like Link is never getting stronger. Your defenses may get better to the point you don't need to heal as often with food items, but your offensive abilities always feel lacking. The more divine beasts you slay, the less common weaker enemies become, meaning the world is literally gaining strength as you are, which creates this dull void of that lack of progression. Not to mention that periodically, blood moons will rise in the night sky, resurrecting all of the fallen bad guys across Hyrule, including the Guardians. Alongside this is, of course, the most divisive aspect of Breath of the Wild that I've mentioned a few times already. The weapon durability system. Why is it here? It doesn't need to exist. Did they enjoy the giant's knife so much that they thought to themselves, Hey, that was everyone's favorite weapon in Acarina, right? 
let's make all weapons like that in Breath of the Wild. By the time you have broken all of your weapons in your inventory, you have been given dozens of opportunities to replace them, often by better weapons. The lack of weapon variety also takes its toll. With so few weapons to use in combat, the combat becomes stale very quickly which is a death knell for most games. When the core gameplay loop becomes unfun, that's a sign you've missed on something huge for your video game. So if the game is trying to add an aspect of survival by making weapons expendable, why do they constantly thrust them into your face? The only thing that prevents you from having weapons is the inventory size. And the inventory expansion is another one of my least favorite aspects of Breath of the Wild. You start out with very few slots, and that's okay for the first few hours of the game. In order to expand your inventory, you need to help Hetsu recover his magical maracas and give him Korok seeds to fill them with. He only allows you to upgrade your slots a few times using the Korok seeds you found the first few times you meet him, if you meet him both times before reaching the Lost Woods. This feels like a slap in the face. They limit you on how much you can expand your inventory at this point, which seems completely player unfriendly. Why not allow players to gain more rewards for doing extra exploration? Why punish the player for doing the one thing this game is trying to reward you for doing? Exploration! Because of this limit on inventory expansion, they passively take away players' potential. For if a player chooses to spend any of these few upgrade slots on anything other than sword slots and maybe one extra shield slot, they are punishing themselves. This all comes back to the combat system. Without the use of special items, the combat in this game feels extremely tedious and lackluster. They did include the ability to gain a special attack called a Flurry Rush on foes if you timed your dodges correctly. Even these don't work as intended because some dodges will reward you with one, and others won't, even if they felt or looked like the proper timing. Using the shield in this game does feel rewarding though. The ability to reflect all different kinds of projectiles with a well-timed shield bash is super satisfying. Having a good old-fashioned Mexican standoff with a Guardian Stalker is one of my favorite encounters in Breath of the Wild. Standing stoically as they charge their devastating eye beams only to have you deflect them back at their mechanical bodies for massive damage. It is one of the few moments in Breath of the Wild that makes you feel like a bona fide bad ass. So there are definitely moments in the combat that reward you for skill. I don't want my negative words to completely overshadow the fact that the combat is smooth and consistent for its majority. There is one thing I've been making fun of Breath of the Wild for, for its entire first year. Shoot it in the eye, stab it till it dies. This is such a glaring vulnerability to nearly every single enemy in the game. Since Link has no special items to help him overcome certain types of enemies, each enemy must be defeatable with what he has, which inherently leaves very few options. This glaring weakness of shooting an enemy in the weak points to stun them, then slashing them, doesn't only affect enemies like the Stone Talus or the Hinox that roam the wilds, but it sadly also works on the Ganon Blights and Calamity Ganon himself to an extent. The dominant strategy to defeating every boss and mini-boss in this game is shoot it in the eye, stab it till it dies. And that just makes me sad as a Zelda fan. Bosses used to have these cool weaknesses to items that you'd have to figure out in order to defeat them. Granted, they weren't always difficult to figure out, but it was fun to do so. It was fun to use new items. It was fun to learn how they worked and what they could be used for. Remember Twin Rova from Ocarina of Time? Using the mirror shield to absorb their fire or ice magic, then shooting it back at whatever witch was weak to what you absorbed? That was awesome, right? It taught you how the shield worked. Now, in Breath of the Wild, every boss is just Goma from the bottom of the Great Deku Tree. Except for one. Praise be to Thunderblight Ganon and his ability to not fall to this terrible tactic of laziness and unintuitiveness. Thunderblight Ganon is the only blight to be immune to this tactic, but the way to break open his defenses isn't much more involved. You just hold up your shield and block his swift darting melee attack, then slash back as he gets stunned. I wish it was more involved than that, 
but hey, it's no arrow to the eye, so I guess it's good? Plus, his second phase also provided the most challenge for me out of all four of the Blights. The way you're supposed to take him down is by using Magnesis on the rods he summons into the fight that will eventually get struck with lightning. Manipulate one of these rods near him to shock him with his own attack and he gets opened up for damage. I ended up targeting Thunderblight Ganon with Stasis to freeze him in time and spamming bomb arrows to break his guard. It worked, but it took a few tries. I still commend him for being the toughest form of Ganon in this game. Not even Calamity Ganon is as difficult as Thunderblight Ganon for me, and that's sad. It's made even more sad by the state of the final dungeon and boss fight of Breath of the Wild. Hyrule Castle should have been this amazing test of all that you've learned and collected throughout your journey, as most final levels are. But nope, they rob the final area of this game of any amount of respect because you can just skip the entire thing by climbing the walls or waterfalls to reach Ganon's chamber without facing a single enemy. That left me with this bland and depressing taste in my mouth kind of like Five Guys Fries. Peanut oil is not good oil to cook fries in, it just doesn't work, much like this rendition of Hyrule Castle. Like eating a burger combo, you start the game out with this amazing world with great feel. It's delicious, like the good cheeseburger, so after you've finished eating the main meat of the game and you're ready to finish it off by eating the fries, your brain is ready for something amazing to finish that initial burger experience off. But all it gets is a depressing cup of peanut oil cooked sadness, leaving you wanting more, or at least something more familiar and trustworthy to end with. Something reliable that you could have counted on. Breath of the Wild doesn't give you that satisfying ending. It's almost as if nothing you've done up to this point had mattered. As if all the hearts, the stamina, and weapons you've collected didn't really mean anything because cooked food items can grant me more temporary hearts and stamina than I can find, and faster. Not to mention, with the help of elixirs, you can boost your offensive or defensive abilities without upgrading your weapons or armor. This was a function of the game I very rarely used. I only brewed elixirs when necessary for new areas. The game never made me feel like experimenting with them was rewarding. I actually regretted wasting the materials. It was just another aspect of the game that felt as if it was unnecessary to implement. A player should never feel this when reaching the end of a game. Regret for playing the game is not an emotion you want to instill in a player. Unless it's part of your narrative, which it most certainly is not in Breath of the Wild. The final boss fight reeks of this sad feeling as well. It is awesome when all of the Divine Beasts blast Calamity Ganon to help you fight him, but after that, the boss fight just boils down to shoot your strongest arrows at his face and dodge to earn the Flurry Rush with the occasional Shield Bash Beam Reflect. And if you have the Master Sword, you don't have to worry about it breaking during this fight. Fighting incarnations of Ganon are the only times it will not break. Calamity Ganon provides nothing new to your experience. Much like his monstrous appearance, he's just a mishmash of every other enemy in the game, but not as strong or threatening. The Lynels are harder than Ganon is, and more fun to fight, to be honest. Because when I fight a Lynel, I feel like there are stakes there, something to prove or earn. When Ganon reaches his final transformation and shows his true form as the Beast Calamity Ganon, it's so disappointingly mundane. His appearance is large and menacing and awesome, but when you mount your horse in Hyrule Field and Zelda grants you a bow that can shoot light arrows, you expect this climactic final test of strength. Riding around, dodging attacks, and aiming at weak points. But once again, Breath of the Wild departs from past Zelda boss fights and makes this boss so easy you can literally stand in one place and hit most of his weak points that spawn on that side. Ganon will not turn to face you, nor try to attack you unless you are directly in front of his face. He just stands there like fodder. The final boss is nothing but fodder. It truly bothers me to no end that the culmination of your journey, everything you've accomplished amounts to the fact that the biggest threat to all of Hyrule is easier to kill than his minions. 
And this is the biggest underlying hidden theme to Breath of the Wild. It's this huge, grand-scale adventure with so much to do and experience, but it all doesn't matter. When you can just rush the final boss with a few measly starter items and food items and defeat him, it makes the entire journey feel moot. Granted, you have to do this with a lot of dedication and some amazing, applause-worthy speedrun tactics. Despite all of its inherent downfalls, this game did accomplish to hold my attention through one new facet of the gameplay that I really do hope returns for all future entries in the franchise. Armor sets. I can't tell you how many hours I scoured Hyrule looking for treasure chests, side quests, or shrines in order to find all the pieces of these armor sets. If you've watched the channel for long enough, you'll already know I'm a huge sucker for playing virtual dress-up in video games. I'm even a victim of being too into hashtag fashion frame in Warframe, or hashtag Mario Barbie in Mario Odyssey, and of course, hashtag fashion hunter in Monster Hunter World. I'm the kind of player who will spend hours grinding out materials or mission runs to get a specific armor, item, or material drop to max out my favorite sets. That's exactly what I did in Breath of the Wild. Most of my time was spent doing just that. I purposefully would go out of my way to hunt certain baddies or gather certain items just so I could 3-star or 4-star my favorite outfits. This made the game more fun for me, having the ability to customize Link's outfits and their colors to any climate or any situation and be both fashionable and functional was the greatest treat this game could present me with. Speaking of treats, the uh, great fairies certainly are some. These beautiful ladies are the ones who upgrade your armor sets for you, yet there's always a catch, you have to have enough rupees to awaken them and proper materials to perform the upgrades. This can get as expensive as needing 10,000 rupees for the fourth Great Fairy Awakening. But hey, that's a small price to pay for the services of these larger-than-life lovelies. If you're lucky enough, you can get classic Link outfits by using the corresponding amiibo paired to previous titles. The armor sets weren't enough to completely save Breath of the Wild for me, though. There was just too many other facets of the game that made me wish it was like previous entries, something familiar that I could count on for a good time. Through all the ups and downs that the Zelda franchise has had, it's clear that Nintendo knew exactly what they were doing with this installment. It's insane the amount of detail and polish this game has, from flipping over rocks to find Koroks, to finding chests with Magnesis underwater. The sense of adventure and overall game feel is what games should feel like, but they dropped the ball on making this game feel like a Zelda game. Yes, it has Link, Zelda, and Ganon, but with all their new and much-needed innovations to the formula, they also left behind what made Zelda so much fun for me and many other players over the years. I loved the structure of old Zelda games, Find dungeon, explore dungeon, get treasure, defeat boss, get plot item, and move on to the next dungeon to repeat that series of events. I'd like to get through a few additional thoughts before I get into my verdict of the game. A few things I noticed while editing this video that I would really like to touch on for clarity or as an additional thought. The paraglider does pair perfectly well with this extended verticality of Breath of the Wild, allowing you to soar over vast expanses to open up new possibilities to your exploration options. A new mechanic to this Zelda game is the fact that you no longer find hearts to replenish your own. Instead, you must eat food ingredients to restore a small amount of health, or use them to cook meals in order to restore more hearts and potentially gain additional status benefits. An additional point that shows the neglect of the importance of the Master Sword is that the Gerudo Chief Riju's personal guard, Buliara, remarks that if Link were the champion of legend, he would be wielding the Master Sword. If you happen to go and get the Master Sword and equip it before this encounter, however, the dialogue does not change to reflect you actually wielding it. They just don't mention it at all, as if it doesn't exist even though it's directly in front of them. If it was so important to mention when you didn't have it, why wasn't it important to mention when you do have it? 
Clearing the shrines grant you one spirit orb from the spirit from within the shrine. Take four of these spirit orbs to a goddess statue in order to increase your heart count by one, or stamina vessel by about one-fifth of a wheel. Each dungeon shares the same mechanic of using the map of the beast to alter the position of some or all of its parts. Each beast has a different element tied to its theme, but that's all. There are no dungeon-specific mechanics throughout all four divine beasts. I have to make one small amendment to my theme argument, and that is the Yiga clan's hideout. Although I do not consider this to be a traditional dungeon, it is executed so well in theme that I have to include it as a mini-dungeon. Congratulations, Yiga Clan Hideout! You weren't even a dungeon and had more theme than the four divine beasts put together. Which is why The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild receives two separate ratings from me. As an overall video game, it earns a fantastic rating. I spent over a week wondering if this should get a fantastic or fun for sure. But the truth is, I played it for well over 120 hours. Nothing that isn't fun gets my attention for that long. You'd have to be slightly insane or so fueled by Nintendo hate to not see how this game nails it in so many ways. I'm just nitpicking at the game because I love the franchise so much. But if you own a Switch and haven't yet purchased this, you've been wasting so much of the potential of this console. Go! Buy it! Now! As an entry into the Zelda franchise, though, Breath of the Wild only earns a potentially fun rating. I had such a hard time seeing this game as a Zelda game throughout my entire time of 120 plus hours playing it. It just didn't feel like Zelda. It felt like... Zelda does Skyrim. I was left feeling regret and second-guessing whether or not I want to buy the next installment. But I love this series and know that I will purchase the next game. One bad entry will not spoil the franchise for me. And if you're also one of those people who loves the classic dungeon and item structure of older Zelda titles, you may also get these same feelings. This will be one of the only Zelda games I will most likely never revisit or 100% complete, and I've completed nearly every Zelda game I've ever played. And I won't be returning to this just because of the 900 Korok seeds are too hard to find. It's because this game fills me with regrets and feelings of wanting something I used to have. When I play a Zelda game, I want a Zelda game, not Diet Skyrim. Darksiders gives me more of a Zelda feeling than Breath of the Wild will ever to me. Like I said, it's not a bad video game by any means. It's very far from it. It is a masterful work of art. It's quite the accomplishment for Nintendo. And I'm very happy that it earned its place as 2017's Game Awards Game of the Year. I don't think it deserves to be. I personally would have chosen Cuphead or Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. But hey, that's just me. Which leads me to the question of the day. Did Breath of the Wild deserve 2017's Game Awards Game of the Year award? Or should it have gone to another title, and why? If you believe it earned it, or did not, don't forget to let me know in the comments below or on Twitter and Facebook at WhatBeef, W-H-A-T-B-I-I-F. If you're new here, hey, how's it going? Thanks for stopping by and watching the whole thing. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. If you'd love to see more reviews from my channel, go ahead and click that subscribe button, like the episode, and check out the links in the end card. I've put up the playlist of all of my previous reviews and also my Mario Plus Rabbids playthrough, which I'm still playing through here on the channel. I also post daily gaming videos to fill in the time between reviews and have some fun. Huh, fun. Seems to be a theme around here, huh? So, if chill, non-rage videos are your thing to put on while you're working or studying, my channel's a great place for you. I can't wait until next time, everybody. See ya!